Ugh, why? I made that in like five hours as a joke. I draw pictures that... Whatever. I knew when I couldn't find a playlist to put that video in that this would turn into a Plague of Gripes series. Great balls! Uh, might have to workshop that one. Alright, you wanna listen to me rail on Dragon Ball? Let's go. This isn't even 50% of my true power. Topic lead-in. Power levels. They suck. If you wanna complain about something in Dragon Ball, this is a good place to start. It's pretty foundational to most problems in the series, along with Toriyama's overall disinterest in writing. It doesn't matter if you're bitching about Khalifla getting Super Saiyan 2, the human characters getting left behind, Frieza coming back as strong as a god, or Goku not winning every fight by going blue and sneezing on enemies. A lot of it comes down to this shit. Why is a video so long? I talk a lot now, shut up. This isn't going to be one of those headcanon this is all their power levels that the Daizenshus don't want you to know videos. But I'm not going to step on the power scaler community's toes either. Power levels are stupid but they're part of the show. So trying to break down what they should in theory be and why certain scenes may have narrative uh, dissonance as a result, well, that makes sense. But I'm not Seth or Chuck or whatever have you. I'm the guy with the writer mentality, so I'm going to address it as such. Which is bad news for Toriyama since he famously wrote the whole series on a monthly basis and made the whole thing up as he went along with no planning whatsoever. So let's talk power levels. Let's, let's kill Trunks Hop in the plot device, create timeline split number six. Boy, that's another video. And go back in time to the 1980s, where cocaine was king, land sharks were first sprouting from the streets of Japan, and Yu Yu Hakusho was a glimmer in Yoshihiro's ball sack. So, in the original Dragon Ball, the concept of power levels wasn't that much of an issue. Ordinary fighters that didn't know about Ki were usually jokes, sure, but that was the premise. It was a gag manga about baby Chinese Wukong Monkey King tilling farmland and delivering milk jugs because he tricked a bipolar supermodel bank robber into living with a registered sex offender and wearing the kind of lingerie a woman puts on when she realizes she married for money and wants a baby from the local pool boy instead. In exchange for punching lessons! It's all you gotta do to make your wish come true! Yeah. So for the vast majority of the front end of Dragon Ball, it was fairly lighthearted, silly, and even the fights were goofy or homages to 70s martial arts films. It wasn't until 89, when I was 7 or 8 or something, that the problem of power levels first appeared. I was a deeply analytical child, so of course I recognized this immediately. This first instance of power level creep that I can identify is Tile Pai Pai, or Mercenary Tao for us godless heathens. Characters get stronger than one another prior to this, but everyone is generally in the same power range as long as they understood what Ki was. To be more specific, the problem happens when Tao defeats Goku, leaves him for dead, and Goku realizes that he isn't quote-unquote strong enough to win. This is a phrase that seems to get translated a lot from Japanese, and it applies to basically any situation in which someone needs to improve. Even if the improvement isn't physical at all, it's often said a character needs to get stronger to confront their current obstacle. Some of that comes down to a cultural difference of the concept of self not being cleanly defined between the physical and the non-physical, like it is here in the West. But either way, character progress is often defined in terms of strength. Goku then climbs the tower to get the MacGuffin. He's got to drink the magic plot device water. When characters in Dragon Ball are really far behind in quote-unquote power, and it makes no sense that they'd be able to improve to be on par with other characters, they will often be given what I'll call a power device. That slang for a Toriyama handjob. Whether it's an old cat, an old slug, or an old Kai, or... Huh, I guess most of them are old men that reach deep inside of young boys. Huh. But yes, thankfully at this point in Dragon Ball, the water isn't actually a power device. The real objective is to reach the water by getting past the Senin Karen, or Korin, whatever. It's mentioned it, that it took Roshi three years to accomplish this, and of course, it takes Goku about three days, because Goku is so strong. The water doesn't do anything, it's just normal water, but because Goku ran up a tower a couple times, ate some Zenzu beans, and tickled a pussy, he can now beat the clothes off towel somewhat easily. What a three-day weekend that was. Now, the problem I have with this sequence isn't necessarily the time frame. Sometimes winning a fight is just a matter of mentality. A lot can change by just altering your goal of attack. Losing from being too aggressive, and then focusing on counters in the next fight. 
You know, that, that sort of thing. But it's apparent with how the fight plays out that Goku's improvement was mainly physical. Korin trained Goku physically. It wasn't like Goku's later training of being taught to move without ringing a bell, or dodging lightning, or learning the sense key. It was just ordinary physical training. More to the point, from a narrative point of view, unlike much of the prior parts of the series, absolutely nothing has changed about the nature of how Goku fought Tao. His number just got bigger. He didn't realize the Dodonpa had a weakness, and then tried to think of a strategy to exploit it. He didn't realize Tao was faster than he was, and take steps to try to nullify that advantage. He simply got stronger. We're told that he got better. We don't see it beyond the fact that he wins. Now, I'm not going to list every example of this, point being, it started early. The Tao example was capped off with Goku annihilating the entire Red Ribbon army, and Roshi declaring that Goku had gotten so powerful that he was now probably out of reach of the rest of them. Sound familiar? He was something like a god now. Toriyama loves to fetishize power development, and have characters state that they're useless compared to Goku. It's Toriyama's only idea for showing the viewer that Goku has made progress. Yet later, Roshi catches up off-screen to forfeit his match with Tension on. I guess they're all gods now, too. Yay, godhood. Okay. Lots of power devices are used from this point on for various characters, from dodging lightning to King Kai's super gravity pebble to Gohan being man-touched into becoming the strongest character in the series by doing no training at all. It happens a lot. Happens a lot. It became a staple of the series that characters would enter an arc in which it is established that the new enemy is a character that is stronger than the prior one. They don't fight any differently. They just have a bigger key number. But to beat the enemy, Goku has to level up his stats so that his numbers are now bigger than the other guy's numbers, usually by grinding in some new exotic location in the same way that he always has. Power levels. But it isn't until specifically Z, when Toriyama thought he was bookending the series, that's why he was called Z, that power levels actually showed up. Even though Piccolo and Goku were the strongest ever, oh my god, so strong, Raditz shows up and is stronger. By like four times, too. The funny thing is, Raditz was a worse fighter than either Piccolo or Goku. His techniques were not as realized, he couldn't raise his battle power or focus his key, and he made tactical errors over and over. But his number was bigger. This shit had Piccolo asking White Jesus will a Namek liver die, because the Kami can't see us in the deep, dark clouds of the power level projects. This happens a lot in Z. Characters often launch attacks that just... They don't do anything to other characters. Even if their surprise attacks are well-timed, the other guy is just too strong! Alright, hold on. Let's, let's talk about the mechanics of why this shit even happens in the series. To show how dumb this is. It'll take some effort on my part. Because Toriyama has not once in the series ever had a Naruto training scene where characters explain the shit that they're doing. The closest we ever got was Gohan quote-unquote training Videl. And the other thing he does there is say, hey, Ki exists. And she's like, nah, it doesn't. I'm holding out my hands and shit ain't happening. And then he goes, nah, it totally does. Just do it. Do it, stupid. And then she just holds out her hands. And the key just shows up. And that's your explanation for how everything in Dragon Ball works. There's magic right above your pussy, and you just push it into your fucking hands, you stupid fucking ape. Fuck you! Sorry, in my personal headcanon, since Toriyama never explains anything's mechanics, I imagine key working sort of like a field around the characters. That glowing shit they always have. When they emit their body heat, and the European sirens start going off, that's stated to be their key radiating from their body. Super Saiyan wastes a lot of key because its dumb heat siren is too loud or whatever. But the reason their clothes don't get torn up from the slightest punch from these god tier super guy kicks is because the power they're using to fight with is also covering their bodies. For example, people often complain about them using weighted clothing that only weighs a few pounds, but they can lift hojillions of pounds, right? So why does it affect them at all? Here's my explanation. Their bodies are just normal human bodies. They just know how to use key. That's the only difference between Mr. Satan and Krillin, other than sex appeal, right? One can use key. 
they both have normal human bodies, or slug or frigid air bodies, whatever. If they don't use their key, which Goku often doesn't when he lowers his guard all the time, they seem to be able to be injured just as easily as anyone else. It's why you can say, attempt to kill Goku Black with a bullet by striking when he has no reason to be using much key. His body isn't being protected or enhanced beyond the limits of a normal human body at that moment, so he's vulnerable to a normal attack. It also explains why Goku can be killed by the love child of Mr. Worry and Slippy Toad. He had his guard down. He wasn't utilizing his key. That's how it works, in theory, since he never explains it. So, if a normal body is weighed down normally with normal weighted clothing without using key, when they wrap their bodies in this shit, the weighted clothing will still be effective because their key is simply amplifying the natural state of whatever is inside of it. Their bodies and whatever they're wearing or using. It's, it's why their clothes don't get ripped, why weighted geese still restrict their movement, why the Ultra Super Saiyan form slows down their movements, and so on. It's the same reason why Trunks' sword can cut through Frieza, but King Cole doesn't get any effect from it at all. It's not the sword, it's the key around the sword. That's how key works, in my head, because Toriyama. So, when it comes to characters' attacks, it's the same shit. I always imagined it sort of like a ballistics test. If you have a tank, you can't shoot it with a pistol a million times to blow it up. That's what armor is for. You have to fire a shell at it that's hard enough and fast enough to actually penetrate the armor and get inside where all the, the sweet man flesh and explosive, and explosive shells are. Sorry, I got a little bit excited. It's all very sexual. It's why armor is angled, sloped, and composited, and so on. An attack has to be strong enough to get through the armor protecting someone in order to inflict any damage. Otherwise, it deals none at all. That's kind of how I imagine these fucking key numbers work. The bigger your goddamn power level, the stronger a key field you put around your body, the stronger your armor. So if a weak little dipshit throws a Kanzen at your neck, hey, who cares? Didn't do nothing. It wasn't strong enough to get through. On the flip side, characters in the show can make attacks that are stronger than they are. So if an enemy has a lot of armor, you can make a 105mm shell that you can fire that you're pretty sure, you're pretty confident, can get through that big-ass power level. But the thing is, the stronger the attack you have to use, the more it tires you out. That's why characters punch and kick one another. You think, shit, if one Kamehameha does the job, just use that shit all the time. Just keep firing those motherfuckers, right? Just keep pumping in that gas. And don't stop pumping those Kamehamehas until you're sure they're dead. But nah, it's hard work shooting marketing beans. So the goal of a fight is to just wear down your opponent with nice, safe, energy-conservative punches and kicks that are just barely strong enough to put little dents in that armor. That'll wear down their power level, their total key, their stamina, their, their sexual energies, and make it easier to get in bigger attacks later on. And if they strengthen their armor so that your punches and kicks do no damage, it actually drains their stamina over time to keep that shit up, so it's ultimately self-defeating. So, approaching this nonsense, shit, sorta of like a video game. In terms of a Dragon Ball fight, your overall goal is to weaken the key field around your opponent by forcing them to draw on their own stamina reserves. You can raise the effectiveness of your own armor by pumping more power into it, but the cost is exponential. So it's generally a better idea to fight at a power level that you're comfortable being at. That's why Frieza lost his first two fights with Goku, and why Goku and Gohan trained to maintain Super Saiyan at a natural state. Playing keep up with this armor versus ballistic shit tires you out. It's also why characters don't take much damage until the very end of a fight when they're exhausted. Because they run out of the energy that they use to pour into the key they're wrapping around their bodies to protect it in the first place. You can dump a lot of key into a single attack to take down a stronger enemy, but if it doesn't kill or severely wound the target, you probably wasted more key than they had to use to recover from the hit in the first place. That's why Vegeta failed to do much of anything to sell, despite surprising him, and why they had such a hard time with Boo. Both could recover from pretty much anything because of how their bodies work, and they had so much key in reserve that you basically had to blow them up with one shot to be able to get rid of them. Trying to wear them down didn't really work unless you could just overpower them by a huge margin. Now, does that sound really stupid and convoluted? 
Yeah, it's almost like it's stupid. There's probably a good reason why Toriyama never explained any of this. Because if you actually try to write it out, it's apparent what a mess it is. I made myself angry talking about that to say this. When you're world building a shonen, the rules of how powers work should be incredibly evident and easy to understand and apply. More than that, if you're going to have a story about fighting, about people developing techniques to outwit enemies, the story of each fight should revolve around how powers work or how moves work and how to counter them. Jojo had lots of writing problems, but it does this really well. One Piece has a small amount of power creep, but it also does this really well. Hunter x Hunter, same kind of deal, etc. If a character in your show is an evil baby that can pull unconscious enemies into a nightmare world created by the user, in which any injuries inflicted are transferred to the real world bodies of the victim, how do you murder the baby? You don't even know it's a murderous baby. You could kill the baby in real life if you knew it was the baby and where its tiny, crushable, supple body was. But maybe you can't use your powers while you're asleep. Why not? Maybe you can think of a way around that. Maybe if you're using your power as you fall asleep, you can summon it into the nightmare to kill the proxy body of the evil clown baby so you can feed it its own feces in the waking world. Hey, it's a thought. What if you're trapped in a jail and there's a warden whose entire body is made of poison and he spits poison and he shits poison and also yet more poison the jail isn't made of poison well some parts might be so you can't touch this guy but what if there was a guy who was a living joke whose only power was that he could manufacture wax out of thin air and even though this jail man is super strong and you can't touch his poo poo Wax man could make wax around the poo poo, and also around the man who made the poo poo. Therefore, you are safe from poison, and also by proxy any fecal based products therein. Now, in these two scenarios, if you put them in Dragon Ball Z, probably not Dragon Ball, but definitely Z, Goku would probably solve both of these situations by turning into his strongest form to give himself a very big number, and then use a Kamehameha to overpower the enemy. Poison Man would get his poison blown away by the big number. Even evil clown Dream Baby would just get overwhelmed by all the power Goku had and pass out because Goku was so strong. Wow, how compelling. What a grand adventure we're on with Goku on his quest to get a big number. Alright, uh, point being, Dragon Ball lost its fight creativity a long time ago. The value of a series that is about employing a rule set about fighting is the application of the rules that you create. Early Dragon Ball did this in a playful way. One character's power was that he he just fucking stinks. He stinks! He rubs his hands all over a sweaty ball sack and makes you smell his finger. That's his attack! Another is a psychic. He can float and control your body, but he gets really distracted with math problems. Another guy is a reverse werewolf that turns into an ugly man when he looks at the moon that Roshi, I mean Jackie Chun, blew up so he reflects light off Krillin's bald ass head to make it look like a moon, to make him ugly again. Uglier. D debatable. Even now, with Goku fighting Beerus or Zamasu or Jiren or wh whomever, the actual fights have not changed since Dragon Ball. The feats you physically see are the same. No one really has done anything any more dramatic than Roshi blowing up the moon in episode 27 of Dragon Ball. Feet strength throughout all of the series has never really changed much, because if you went past that limit, fights wouldn't make any sense visually. You couldn't draw them. It would just be panel after panel of action lines with other panels of stars and galaxies being atomized. It would be stupid. And more than that, it would be boring. We're simply told that characters are faster or stronger, or that they can't be seen by one another anymore. And that happens constantly to reassure the audience that yes, progress is happening. And then everyone can see one another again later because I guess their eyes got better and Toriyama needs people to commentate on how strong Goku is, and they can't do that if they can't see him. Otherwise, if characters aren't telling the viewer that the fight is better than the last one, we wouldn't know because it all looks the fucking same. 
don't worry, this punch that you've seen a thousand times is actually the best punch anyone has ever thrown. Please believe us, because this is the only value of the series. If you took what characters say about one another as lol, everyone would be moving so fast that none of their brains would be able to even process it. There's something called a tiger beetle that runs so fast for its body size, it can cover 120 of its own body lengths in one second. It's so fast that it actually has to stop running just to see where the hell it even is. Light, light just becomes a smear of nonsense information if you go too fast. Even if it was, it was key, like, it, they don't rely on their eyesight, they're dissensing key. Even if that's the case, there's still a limit to how fast your electricity-based brain computations can process this shit. Even if they're the fucking Flash, and their powers are relativity-based, that would still mean they're fighting at the same speed they were in Dragon Ball, as long as their power levels match up. Trying to convince the audience that everyone is actually so fast that they're not only flying, kicking, and firing key beams faster than sound and light, but also that these fucks are talking, fucking talking while they're doing it, faster than light. Talking to one another, faster than light, is the most asinine thing you could ever convince yourself to believe. And people believe it. There are fans that will argue until they're blue in the face that because power levels are in the quintrillions now, that we're just seeing a slowed down version of events for our benefits, which also includes them talking to one another. So these fights are supposed to actually be five minutes long or ten minutes long, but over the span of a whole arc are, is actually literally hour. Like if you just count the lines of dialogue, if you measure the amount of time that they spend just talking, it's longer than the fight could conceivably ever be even if it went into the negative values, it's still for our benefit. It's just that we're seeing it slow down. Fuck you! The characters are no stronger than they were in Dragon Ball. Mountains blow up at the same size, beam sizes are the same, characters vanish the same as they always have. The feats are the same because they have to be on the page. They have to be understandable enough for the reader to grasp their scope, but also just large enough to be impressive. The fights are the same. <clears throat> and you cannot impress me with this. The ceiling was hit a long time ago. You could have Goku rear back and do a fucking Kamehameha for the millionth goddamn time, and he fires this shit into the space. It goes past the moon to show the scale. We, we miss the, the moon back again, right? It blows up the moon again for the hell of it. It goes past the sun and the beam gets wider and eclipses the whole sun. It's bigger than the sun. This shit puts Sephiroth's pussy supernova to shame. And we pan out and we see the fucking beam just lawn mowing through the whole galaxy now, the whole Milky Way galaxy. It's just a cone, a blue key, plowing through the whole galaxy. And then it pans out even more. And we see the whole gal galactic cluster, the whole local cluster. And the beam just starts exploding galaxies because it's so big. And we just, we cut back to Goku on Earth. And it's just a cloud of dust and blue shit. And he's screaming, Aah! Super Saiyan Ultra Deluxe 6.7 Baconator Edition. KO Ken times 4 Google Quinn Billion. And it shows the fucking Universal Milky Way Supercluster. And the beam just, it, it vaporizes all of it. And it zooms out again. And it's just white light, because it's too zoomed out, and all you're seeing are dots of ultra clusters of galaxies, like pixels on a computer monitor. And Goku is just mowing them all down, because he's so strong, and his number is so big! And then it goes to Cell, or Jiren, or Demigra, or Pilaf, after absorbing the seven rainbow multiverse Dragon Balls of Legend, or whatever, and he's like, Oh no, his power level is too big. And he vanishes. Because the big Kamehameha was the biggest. And that field of white light from before has a big black cone where the strong attack hit to kill the bad man. And Goku is back on Earth. And he wipes his brow and he gives a thumbs up to the camera.
Goku, I'm not impressed. That was stupid, what you did. You should be ashamed of yourself. Dragon Ball hit that ceiling a long, long time ago. The feats are the same, because if Goku did that, it would be like a drunk hitting rock bottom and waking up in a gutter full of dead cats and realizing he had gone too far. The feats are the fucking same. It doesn't matter what number you attach to it to convince the audience that there has been plot escalation. Dragon Ball's power levels have not changed much at all since the very first pages of Goku shrugging off a gunshot. Goku didn't improve when he fought Tail Pai Pai. He was given an artificially created point of contention and then allowed to move past it after a scene that only existed to assure the viewer that he was making progress in his training. That's the whole point of that scene. That's how Dragon Ball is written. But why? How did this happen? How did we go from creative, fun fights to angry-faced number battles? Well, like I said before, the answer to most of this shit comes down to marketing and Toriyama's horrible writing. Dragon Ball is the granddaddy of Shonen, so it's, it's not like it was emulating bad behavior that was cancers to the genre already. Toriyama manufactured this exact problem. But this problem of narrative escalation has always existed in writing. If Ahab had killed Moby Dick and then survived to Moby Dick 2, would he have had to kill an even wider whale? With even more canvas-like elements projecting his character flaws back upon him as he attempted to slay the sins handed down from Adam on down until his heart bursts again like a cannon upon the mirror of his own soul? I don't know, maybe. If your character completes their arc, and you still want to use the character, what the hell do they do? Common problem. It's just that in Shonen, the problem isn't non-literal. It's the physical crux of the entire setting. Shonen Jump, when Dragon Ball was being published, had been around for about two decades. It was established. And this was 1980s Japan. The United States was actually afraid that the Japanese economy would surpass them at the time. I remember hearing this shit on the news all the time whenever I was a kid. Before the Berlin Wall came down. Also, Challenger explosion and the Iran hostage crisis. 80s were fucked up. But in Japan, business was cutthroat. You needed to maintain that fucking reader count. And if your manga establishes that an old man is the strongest person in the world, the, the readers immediately want to know. When does Goku get stronger than the old man? Dragon Ball Super right now is desperately trying to reel in power levels. It really is. It's doing it with tears now, they still exist, but they're trying desperately not to focus on it too much. But even now, fans are still angry that Goku hasn't gotten stronger than Beerus. When's it gonna happen? When's he gonna beat Beerus? Jiren is the new hot shit at this moment. And people are already wanting to know Who's the strongest? You know, who, who's the strongest guy ever is going to be after that? What's the next one? What's the next strongest man? And he hasn't even fought anyone yet. Jiren hasn't even fought, and people are already wanting to know what's going to come after that. Will it be El Padre Grande? Is he secretly the real god of the universe? Can white-haired Colombian edgelord Gohan defeat this new threat? Once you kill him, do they go to another multiverse? Fans don't care. They're like dumb little kids. If you show them something, they want it. They want it now. Baby want now. And you can't step backwards. If Goku defeats the fucking devil and his reincarnation, what do you do then? Well, better go to fucking space. Shonen Jump's offices. It pressures writers to maintain this escalation. So readers will keep being interested in what's happening in the future. If you went from the Demon King Piccolo to Goku fighting bandits or something, no one's gonna buy it. It's nonsense. That's part of what happened to GT, other than it being shit. They go out into space, where supposedly Frieza was nightmarishly stronger than anyone who had ever lived. After killing his super clone cell, and after killing Boo, the incarnation of evil itself. And there's just guys there. Guys that are stronger than that. For no reason. Just with no explanation. Because new enemies have to be stronger, or you lose viewers, you lose uh, readers. In terms of writing, each new threat has to be entirely new and a step up in severity from the last. Other shonens get around this problem by moving horizontally. 
Just like a bad MMO versus a good MMO, which almost none of, the easiest way to release new content is to release stuff that's the same strength as the shit that you already have, but packaged in a completely new way. That way it's still interesting because you've never seen it, but ultimately it doesn't tip the damage scale. A bad MMO or a poorly written show fucks this up by just raising numbers, because they know people will buy it to keep up. And the thing is, even though all shown is faces problem, because of market pressure, it's still primarily Toriyama's fault. It's not like he just slipped and fell, oh I can't help it, it's still his fault. He never needed to establish that Roshi was the, the world's strongest. He never needed to make it clear that the immediate cast was the only group of high-level fighters. When they went into fucking space, space, where there are infinite worlds, infinite galaxies, infinite super clusters of galaxies, Toriyama never needed to state that Frieza was the strongest person there. He took a setting that could, in theory, be infinite, literally infinite, and he reduced it to the size of a couple of cities narratively by stating that the only landmarks in power were the ones immediately visible. Stupidest thing in the world to do, and he did it, intentionally. Maybe he should maybe he should aim to do the stupidest thing in the universe now. Oh wait, he did. With a multiverse! Now there are twelve universes! Not not another one. Not another one. Not two. Twelve. And what's the first thing he does? Gather all the strongest guys from all of them at the same time. And guess what? As a joke, almost all of them are weak, stupid-looking jobbers. Again, he narratively reduces the scope of his own setting and the internal landmarks of the character's potential stories for no reason at all. Infinite possibilities. Twelve. Twelve infinite possibilities. And he blows his wad on the first jerk. I harp on this all the time. For, the, for those of you that don't know. When you're world building, there's two things you don't want to do. One, do not state the scope or limits of your setting. That is, don't set your story universe on one island and mention there's nothing beyond it. This is the only island. Don't introduce that the bad guys are four gods that created your entire setting and are stronger than anyone and then kill them off in the first story. And two, do not limit the potential diversity of anything you introduce in your setting. So don't introduce a race of crocodile people or whatever and say they all have a specific green color skin, they all have yellow eyes, and they all dress the exact same clothing, and they all act and believe the same things. It's a fantasy world, and you're obliterating its potential magic of discovery and restricting narrative potential for absolutely no reason other than you are fetishizing a particular element of it. And that's exactly what Toriyama's problem is. He loves the idea of someone being the strongest in the world. The strongest in the universe. The strongest in the multiverse. Why? Because it's a lazy, easy way to make it clear the stakes are as high as they could ever get, and when you win, it's a huge victory. He fetishized that so much throughout his entire career that it has poisoned every element of not only his own series, but other series as well that came afterwards. That's why power levels suck. They only exist to assure the viewer that what they're seeing is a better version of the exact same thing that they already saw. You replace creativity with the lie of progress. It's vertical progression rather than horizontal. It's being given a video game sword with a higher damage number. It has the same animations. It changes nothing about your personal agency as a player. It just has a bigger number. Toriyama is not creative when it comes to power sets. Powers are almost always physical, straightforward, and don't require any level of thought to understand. Most are just balls of light in different colors, which is funny for a colorless manga. I think if you threw a single JoJo stand user into Dragon Ball, or hell, a, a psychic with their own territory from Yu Yu Hakusho into Dragon Ball, or the fucking Death Note, Goku and everyone else would be dead within a week for how stupid they all are, and how dumb their, their movesets all are. So why, why make this video? I don't monetize this shit unless Toei claims it and seizes it. This could get half a million views or 5,000, and I would not care. I make my living off Patreon, who cares? I bring this up 
mainly because I get fucking tired of people bitching about power levels. How come Krillin can hold back Goku's Kamehameha? Uh, how, uh, why would Roshi make Frost dodge? He should just be able to just take the punches. Why is 17 so strong all of a sudden? How come children could be born as strong as a super Oh, wait, wait, that's Z, so that gets a free pass, doesn't it? It doesn't matter. Roshi being outclassed in power, but managing to beat people with creativity is exactly what Dragon Ball should be. Do not complain about it. Don't fetishize Z or for God's sakes GT and say it did it better. When you compliment or ignore the writing problems Toriyama created, you're also undermining the hard work better writers put into their own work. Don't be that guy. Don't be an enabler and pussyfoot away from pointing out that Super is doing this shit again with Jiren. Just look at it for what it is. It's okay to like something, but acknowledge it's shitty writing. This is just entertainment, it's not a religion or something. Toriyama is a terrible writer. His strengths are gags, drawing poo-poo on sticks, and general whimsy. Don't do things like pretend that the Cell games were well written, when it was an abomination of artificially created tension. That's yet another video. But I don't blame you. Like I said at the start, power levels are a part of Dragon Ball. Just like racism is a part of your Uncle Joey. You have to address things for what they are, not what they should be. Does Super's power scaling make any sense for how Z was written? No, it is not internally consistent. Everyone in the series should be completely useless, and so far behind it's impossible for them to catch up. But that would be a horrible story if some fans actually got their way. If your setting is that toxic, change your setting. I don't care if it's internally inconsistent with the cancer that Toriyama infected the series with. I don't care if your Uncle Joey doesn't want to go to Subway because an Indian family runs it. He can fuck off, because he is the least valuable component to your experience. Power levels are a narrative crutch, and nothing else. The feat strength has remained generally the same since Dragon Ball. Nothing has changed. When Super or anything else ignores power levels, yes, acknowledge it. But also realize your Uncle Joey is a stupid bitch. And if Uncle Joey doesn't like Roshi, he can fuck out to Fazoli's.